Okay, hi, I'm very happy to introduce our colloquium speaker today, Ian Hewins. And little did I know, oh, over a decade ago now, when Ian knocked on my door that I was in for years and years of wonderful and vibrant collaboration. It has been a pleasure working with Ian on the Macintosh archive. I think this has been a service to the community and his hard work has been absolutely crucial and central to that. Um, this colloquium I'm looking forward to, it's going to be telling us about a lot of the science that has come out of the Macintosh archive of solar synoptic data sets. And um, I'm gonna let Ian take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction, Sarah. Appreciate that. Um, so I guess all of you know who I am now. I'm Ian Hewins. And yes, I think it was 2012 um, when I brought the Macintosh data to Sarah at HAL. Uh, but uh, good morning. Hello. Uh, it's great to be back here. I live about 20 minutes from Homer, Alaska, and I very often see more moose than human beings. So being in a room with this many people in and of itself is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm here to talk about the Macintosh archive, both the original archive and uh, how we're extending it, which we're calling the Macintosh Archive Plus. But I've done some other work and made some other maps um, that I'm going to talk about too. So it's it's about extending the long-term data set and its applications to solar physics research. So it is a set of solar synoptic or Carrington maps um, that runs from 1964 to 2009. It's 600 maps, 600 Carrington rotations, and it um, covers solar cycles 20 through 23, plus about a year into solar cycle 24. Um, Bob McFadden is not here, but I expect many of you know Bob. Uh, he and I were the ones that brought the archive uh, to HAO and uh, Sarah when Pat started showing signs of dementia. Um, so we're, we're extending the archive in a digital manner as opposed to the old pencil and paper method. This is an example of a map that I made in paperless mapping or digital mapping, uh, counting to rotation 2105. Um, it is from solar cycle 24. And we're basically trying to keep all of the techniques as similar, if not identical, as possible. So just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, red is negative polarity coronal holes, blue is positive polarity coronal holes, uh, gray is areas of dominant negative polarity, light blue is areas of dominant positive polarity, the dark green is filaments, the light green is polarity inversion lines, and sunspots and plage regions are various shades of orange and yellow, as you can see down there at the bottom. Uh, so in addition to extending the archive, um, I also got the opportunity to work with the Whoopi Solar Minimum Study Group. Um, it's a collaborative effort, collaborative effort involving NASA and HAO as the organizers. It's the third such solar minimum study and if I remember correctly, we had 777 people involved in our mailing list uh, last time I heard. So this is an example of one of those maps. Again, no plage, no polarity inversion lines, filaments, et cetera. Um, but I do establish coronal polarity with magnetograms depending on sources of data I'm using. So a little bit of the background of the historical archive. Um, I see Holly nodding over there, recognizing Pat McIntosh. That was Pat in 2011 in front of his home, a little bit before we started to realize that the dementia was affecting him. Um, it was very sad, very frustrating, and for a while we just weren't sure what was going to happen with his life's work. Um, what we ended up doing was going through it all, deciding what was valuable and what was not. One of the surprising things we found was Solar Cycle 19 made in the style of Pat McIntosh with Todai Canal data, data by a guy named Makarov and another one named Shiva Raman. Uh, and we have digitized that Solar Cycle 19 and included it in our archive, but it's, it's not identical, but it's similar. Anyway, so Pat grew up in a tiny town in Illinois and uh, through a high school science project, uh, well, it was a science fair, you know, the competition science fairs at high school. He 
he won a scholarship to Harvard University. Um, so while he was at Harvard, he got the opportunity to do a summer internship at Sacramento Peak Observatory in New Mexico. And it all went so well that he applied for a job and worked there from 1960 to 1965. Um, after that, in 1965, he moved to Boulder and the Space Environment Laboratory, which is now SWIPC, the Space Weather Prediction Center here in Boulder. And he was um, he was one of the first three operational solar forecasters. Uh, he has been referred to uh, as one of the founding fathers of space weather forecasting. Uh, so he trained early NOAA um, and U.S. Air Force forecasters and observers, uh, as well as working with Skylab astronauts and sort of advising them before they went up to Skylab. Sort of like Ricky Eglund is doing now, uh, Noah, he was a NOAA on-site forecaster in Houston during the Apollo and Skylab missions, and he developed the Macintosh Sunspot classification system in 1966. It's sort of um, an addition to existing Sunspot classification systems, but it is still in use today. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about his mapping. Uh, so this is actually the first attempt at a uh, Carrington map of PATS. Um, so he developed methods for inferring solar magnetic fields initially just from H-alpha imaging observations. So basically the idea was you've got a line of filaments, you've got another line of filaments, the polarity is opposite on either side. We know there's a polarity at each pole. So that was very basic at the beginning. However, by the time he made this map, um, it had evolved into the first handmade H alpha and magnetogram based synoptic maps. So, this is an incomplete version of Carrington Rotation 1487, its beginning of solar cycle 20 in the year 1964. So, uh, Bob McFadden and I were at sort of last assistant cartographers, but he began training assistant cartographers pretty early on. And um, in those early days at uh, the Space Weather, uh, Space Environment Laboratory, a lot of people were working on different ways to sketch the features on the sun. So he got these assistant cartographers who helped both with the workload and added a degree of consensus to the map meeting. So you can see the bottom map is um, Carrington Rotation 1935 from Solar Cycle 23. Bob McFadden was the primary cartographer on this um, under Pat's, Pat's tutelage. Uh, you can see in the northern and southern hemispheres, there are polar coronal holes, those ash marks inside the line of the cartographic symbol for the hole. So that, that's what that's showing you right there. So that is using helium-10830 data, um, which became available in the early to mid-1970s and uh, allows you to utilize, uh, allows you to, to include coronal hole boundaries. Um, so basically, we got two grants from Boston College. And what we did with those grants um, initially was to fill in all partial maps and anywhere where coronal hole data did exist but hadn't been included on a map, we included it. Some of, some of the maps like this one here, Carrington Rotation 1487, we just pretty much started from, from fresh data. Uh, so we can't use helium-10830 anymore, really. Uh, Historical Archive used helium-10830 exclusively well. I did get crazy a couple of times. I used little Skylab data and other weird stuff like that, but almost exclusively helium and 830 data for coral hole boundaries. Um, and its collection was really phased out by NSO and EUV has really become the accepted standard for coral hole observation. So by 2015, if not 2014, helium 10830 was no longer available on a consistent enough level to even make maps. Uh, the upper left image there, that's a Solus NSO uh, Helium-10830 image. By the way, Solus is still serving all the data they have collected. Uh, it's no longer readily available, so that you can sort of step through and look at the images, but you can download FITS files and convert them into images or do whatever you might want to do with 
such data. Um, for the EUV data, I really like Helio Viewer uh, for one reason. Um, you can get SOHO, SDO, and Stereo A data from the same website. You can, with SOHO and uh, SDO, you can get magnetograms for definitely the same day, if not almost the identical time as the EUV data, which is very useful to me. Uh, so what we're looking at here in the center is AIA 171. Most of you probably recognize 193 on the right. That's 211 at the bottom and 304 on the bottom right. Uh, SOHO, we use fairly similar bands, but it wasn't identical. Of course, it's 195, which is fairly close to 193. And the 304 is the same. But anyway, point is, take a look at these coronal hole bands. Kind of see right there is kind of an unusual coronal hole coming in from the upper left quadrant. And there's also a kind of wild looking southern polar coronal hole uh, as well. And you can see them in all of the images. However, the size it is, the morphologies do differ. Um, I'm not reading what I wrote, just that one. So to avoid switching from helium 10830 to EUV data in the middle of the solar cycle, uh, we just adopted EUV as the new standard for all Macintosh style maps made for Carrington rotations after December 2008, which was the end of solar cycle 23. So coronal hole boundaries can be inferred from both data types, but the locations of these boundaries are not identical in helium 10830 and the UV wavelengths. And as a matter of fact, coronal hole boundaries do not appear in identical locations even among the different UV wavelengths. Therefore, we made some helium 10830 to EUV comparison maps at four different phases of the solar cycle in solar cycle 24. So the four EUV wavelengths that we used are for the SVO data, the ones you see below. So as most of you probably know, EUV data are available from spacecraft positioned along the Sun-Earth line during the years 1996 to 2012. That was from Solar and Heliophysics Observatory, SOHO. And from 2010 to the present day, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, SDO, Atmospheric, in Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, the AIA. Since we are extending the archive using EUV for coronal boundaries, beginning with the start of solar cycle 24 in December 2008, we made maps for comparison with helium 10830 with SOHO and SDO data. We made maps for two Carrington rotations near solar minimum, one in SOHO and one SDO, and two near solar maximum, both with SDO data. Excuse me. So here you see what coronal hole maps when you lay four different wavelengths over top of each other. It starts to get a little convoluted, gets difficult to determine which wavelength is which thing is which. And um, so this, this cutout here on the top is that central upper hemisphere, a uh, small coronal hole there. So the green is the 284, the pinkish is the 195, 304 is the blue, 171 is the gold. You can see if, if you just went with the area of agreement between all four wavelengths, you would get that tiny little area in the middle between the blue and the uh, pink and green and yellow. <laughs> However, if you combine all four of them together, what you end up with is actually a coronal hole that's larger than it would appear in any other one wavelength and quite possibly in helium 10830 as well. Now, this is solar minimum, dead solar minimum. Two versions, this is the same map you were just looking at. Um, two versions of Carrington rotation 26, seven, 2076 from the solar minimum, 2324. The top map was made with helium 10830 images, and the bottom map was made with SOHO daily images from the same days as the helium 10830 images uh, were collected. The coronal hole polarity was determined using SOHO HMI magnetograms from the same day. Um, a little scary, huh? They don't look too similar. So although all the coronal holes visible in the helium 10830 are also visible in the EUV data, their positions and morphologies differ, 
and more significantly, there are many more crawl holes visible in that new data. And in fact, it's roughly twice as many crawl holes in the UV data. And yeah, this, this was initially quite concerning. Um, here's two versions of Carrington Rotation 2100, a little bit later, almost two years after solar minimum. Again, the top map is made with Pen 830, and the bottom map is made with EUV. However, this time it was Solar Dynamics Observatory daily images from the same days as the 10830 images, and this time it would a coronal hole polarity was determined using SDO HMI magnetograms for the same days. Again, the coronal holes that are visible in 10830 are also visible in the EUV data but their positions and morphologies differ, and many more coronal holes are visible in the EUV data. However, we know that some of the smaller coronal holes seen in the EUV data do not appear in the AIA-193 band, and in other cases, if I had only been looking at the 193, they would have either been too small to include or not really dark enough, not really black enough for me to consider it a coronal hole. So I realized at a certain point that the other wavelengths were sort of biasing me towards what I was seeing in 193. All right, now we're getting a little bit better here. So this is two versions of Carrington rotation 2117 from when the Northern Hemisphere was at sunspot maximum for solar cycle 24. And most of you probably know that generally Northern Hemisphere does things a little bit earlier than the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and of course, that stands true for sunspot numbers as well. So, uh, you know the drill. The top map was made with 10830. The bottom map was made with daily images, of UV daily images from STO. And the uh, coronal hole polarity was determined using STO HMI magnetograms. And we tried to get all of those images from the same days. Before I go on to that next section, I just want to point out here that we're at we're coming up here on solar maximum. We're at solar maximum for the northern hemisphere. And most of you probably know that polar coronal holes go away, um, polarity at each pole flips, and then eventually the coronal holes will show up in the opposite pole to where they were polarity-wise before. And right here, you see the northern polar coronal hole is dissipating, going away. Um, yeah, we see a little difference in the 10, 8, 30, that little squiggly weird polar coral hole up at the top there. But um, that southern hemisphere polar coral hole is pretty strong. However, see that negative, that red polar coral hole right down there getting close? So it's kind of sneaking up there, kind of getting ready to jump into the pole after the polarity switches. Uh, anyway, back to the map. We see greater agreement in the total number of coral holes but again, the morphologies and sizes differ. Most of the smaller coronal holes seen in EUV do not appear in the AIA-193. And in other cases, like the previous map, I wouldn't have included them. Um, they would have been too small if I had only been looking at the 193 or not dark enough, not solid black enough. I mean, consider them true coronal holes. Now back to the science -y part. So that southern positive polarity coronal hole is now gone. And not only is that negative polarity one bait on the right, basically sitting in the same place, ready to jump in, but a few other negative polarity coronal holes have joined it at that latitude. Um, so these are two versions of Carrington rotation 2148. This is when the Southern hemisphere was at sunspot maximum for solar cycle 24. And again, 10, 8, 30 images were used from the top. And, um, SDO daily images from the same days were used from the bottom. The coronal hole polarity was determined using SDO HMI magnetograms from the same day. And we see the greatest agreement in both the total number and the positions of the coronal holes. Closer inspection does reveal that the differences in morphology largely come from the wavelengths other than AIA-193. So what can we conclude here? There is clearly a greater difference between what is visible in helium 10830 and EUV data at solar minimum than there is at solar maximum. And that's perhaps due to the weaker magnetic field strength at solar minimum. However, if we 
limit ourselves to AIA 193 or for SOHO AIA 195, it does appear we get closer agreement to helium 10830. And I want to kind of stress that. I'm not trying to, to figure out exactly establish where a coral hole is, where its boundary is. That's kind of a, a, a difficult thing to pin down. What I'm trying to do is come as close as possible to the original archive that was made with 10830 to try and get agreement, to try and get consistency. So exactitude is sort of elusive, consistency is not. Whoopee! The whole heliosphere and planetary interactions will be chrome hole Carrington maps and solar wind studies. So I think I told you a little bit about Whoopi already. Um, quite a few people involved in that. It's a collaborative effort, solar minimum study, and the third of its, its uh, kind. Each time a new aspect has been added, and this time the planetary interactions were. So kind of trying to get a whole heliospheric perspective on what's happening. Um, so we created a set of Macintosh style Carrington maps focusing exclusively on coral holes. Um, some of you may have noticed there are some weird little coral holes in that type that do not appear to have polarity. Well, basically, um, they're made with Stereo A data. So Stereo A maps are on the top and SDO maps are on the bottom. Um, at this point, Stereo A was roughly eight days earlier in viewing time than SDO. Um, so we tried to confirm polarity uh, when we found agreement with positions of coronal holes in either the previous or following Carrington rotations um, in the SDO data. However, when that wasn't possible, uh, when we did not find agreement in location, we just gave them that light yellow color to indicate there's something there, we just don't know what polarity it is. So we made maps for Carrington rotations 2209 to 2227, and for several Parker Solar Probe campaigns, one coral hole map was made with SDO data, and one was made with stereo A UV data. These allowed us to undertake comparative minima studies of coronal holes using these maps and the original Macintosh archive. Uh, I just had a paper, I'm not sure where it is. It's officially been accepted. I got an email that said it's been published. Um, so it will be coming out soon, but that's the uh, comparative minima studies and uh, these maps. Here are um, some examples of those maps. These are Carrington rotations 2209 to 2214. And uh, just note the recurring coronal hole groups of both polarities. Expect to remember blue is positive, red is negative. Um, and the stereo A maps are on the left and the SDO maps are on the right. So you can, the, chronologically it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think once we get down to the bottom here, there are something like seven days different, where it was eight days different at the top. So at Stereo A was slowly getting closer to being in alignment with Earth. Um, so yeah, look at the recurring positive polarity coronal hole that's sort of in the northern hemisphere and sort of associated with the northern uh, polar coronal hole. Uh, and then uh, associated with that southern hemisphere coronal hole is a negative polarity coronal hole that at times is, is much more diffuse, um, but it recurs. So these sort of set up recurring bands of solar wind that kind of double lapped us every time the sun went around um, and made for more interesting solar wind studies. I jumped the center six maps. Um, just because I thought these ones at the end were more interesting. But I'd like to point out that positive polarity blue coronal hole on the right-hand side of the maps. Um, it slowly shifted in those next six rotations further to the right. Then there was a CME and bam, it jumped back to where you see it in the upper right here corner there. So that was, that was very interesting. And I expect a paper to come out of that in and of itself. Um, but yeah, the right, Right hand side shows coronal hole Carrington rotations, coronal hole maps for Carrington rotations 22, 22 through 22, 27. Um, 
the southern hemisphere coronal hole groups are definitely breaking down and even that positive polarity coronal hole is sort of dissipating and going away but it made for recurring double strikes from solar wind a number of times through the through the uh 2209 2227 period okay here they are the solar wind studies or at least some of them um, we utilized the DeRosa PFSS model to apply solar wind book points and estimated velocities um, of the solar wind from those sources with both sets of maps. Uh, so that's an STO one on the top. That's a stereo A map on the bottom. Um, and uh, these are, as a supplement to the maps, to gain a heliospheric perspective on the solar wind. So we traced the solar wind back to solar sources, and we measured and compared the solar wind along the Sun-Earth line, utilizing the Omni database from Stereo A, from the Stereo A spacecraft using its collected data, and from the MAVEN spacecraft orbiting Mars. This is carrying to rotation 2220 from July 2019. Uh, again, top map on the uh, top maps are made with SDO EUV data. Top left shows the foot points and velocities of solar wind from the Sun Earth line. Top right shows foot points and velocities estimated at Mars Maven. And the bottom map made with stereo A data shows foot points and velocities estimated uh, at stereo A. Uh, Expect all of you know that Mars is at 1.5 AU and not one, which is where STO and stereo A line up. Uh, now, take a look at the heliospheric current sheet here. Uh, first of all, notice that it's different in each map based on uh, the solar wind where it's reaching. Uh, but also, this is a model. Basically, the position of the heliospheric current sheet determines whether the solar wind source is coming from the northern or southern hemisphere. Um, and you can check out, um, I hate it, my cursor disappears. You can check out, we've got some high velocities right there, some similarly right there. Here we're getting some higher velocity from that southern group, and same over here. Um, so that's what I'm saying high velocity, 550, 600, that sort of thing. So yeah, um, this is Carrington Rotation 2210 uh, SDO data with uh, the ROSA PFSS model for points applied. And below it is backmapped on the solar wind data. And you can see pretty clearly here that the peaks in the velocity do line up. That's what back mapping does. It takes it and moves it because, you know, right to left is, is chronological in a synoptic map. So we flipped the um, Omni data um, so that it was also going right to left. So you're, you're crossing a thinner longitudinal band there with that coronal hole. So you get a thinner peak in velocity, you're crossing a wider band of coronal hole there, and you get a wider band of velocity. Now, Admittedly, these bottom plots are not impressive. Um, we've been working on improvements to them, and this is for a paper that we're working on right now that um, will end up with, I promise, much prettier plots. But still, you can kind of see that the bumps do correspond in the, the data below. Uh, now we're looking for a, a heliospheric uh, perspective on the sun. So here are Three perspectives, Stereo A, Earth Omni, and Mars Maven. These are all back mapped, and it's for Carrington rotation 2214. And I guess what's most interesting is um, you get the same three, same bumps from those two coronal hole groups in, at each position. Uh, due to the 1.5 AU, you get more angular uh, degrees going on here with these lines, but you know, the bumps are the same. And again, we're gonna get prettier plots for the bottom ones and look at different things, but some of the bumps do correspond nicely to the velocity peaks. And this is this is our in process, what we're trying to approve and, and what our final um, plots will hopefully look like. We're not done yet, this is getting better. This is not back mapped. They are examples of omnisolar wind data for Carrington rotations 2209 and 2210. And again, so right here, you're seeing B shoots up right before you get the high velocity, B shoots up 
for the high velocity. Similarly over here, we kind of see some stuff like that going on here and here too. Um, down here at the bottom, AP is going up as DST drops somewhat consistently. And well, that middle there is really kind of a mess. It's not even labeled, but um, <laughs> stuff going on there that we will make much more clear once we get this paper published. All right, so I was talking about the fact that um, the original archive is made by hand with paper, pencils, and light tables. Um, it got pretty messy at times. Cats would jump up, try to take your paper clips, run off with your maps, run off with your images. Um, so yeah, that's all over. Um, and, and lots of us had assistant catographers. Bob had the same problem at his house that I have at mine, except I have two cats. Anyway, no more of that. So We're now using- on a cat stick? <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> 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 Anyway, um, so yeah, now we're using digital mapping techniques. I've also referred to them as paperless mapping. So nothing is printed out. It's all done in Photoshop and IDL. Uh, yeah, maybe the cats were sort of trying to give me confirmation, you know, where yeah, I was right, where I was wrong. I'm surprised the moose cooperated. The moose should have, yeah. Absolutely. Maybe the bears. Uh, so yeah, we try to make the process as close to identical as possible. You start out with your daily images. I'm just going to show you um, the EUV 193, AIA 193 and magnetograms, but the process is basically identical for H alpha. Um, and, you know, you adjust your brightness and contrast, um, get a pretty image so you can figure out what you're looking at. The original archive, it started in 64. Data wasn't consistently available at that point. It did get better over the years in terms of consistency and quality. Um, but for example, EUV, you don't have to worry about clouds. You know, when you're looking at 10, 8, 30, you get cloudy days, et cetera. So they used to use uh, a cadence of roughly every five days. Sometimes it was six days. Once in a while, it was four. I just exploded, I just sped it up. And um, because I can consistently use every four days. On the odd occasion when I can't get data um, from all three sources every four days, I go to three as opposed to going to five um, days. Uh, so the, the most difficult thing to get the highest quality for is the uh, hydrogen alpha images. There are times when I get it at the first website that I look at. There are times that I'm going through four or five websites. Lately, I've been able to use Mauna Loa Solar Observatory data, and that kind of gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, it's keeping it in the family. Um, but once I find the best H-alpha image, um, then I try and find a magnetogram and UV images for the same days used and if possible, close to the same time used. You can see here on the right hand side, I started to mark features. It's a little difficult to see the black line over the black coronal hole, but I guess that means that I'm drawing it in the right place. You can kind of see there's a little itty bitty polar coronal hole there that I've marked. Um, if you're used to looking at these images, what this is probably telling you is that the B angle favors the southern hemisphere in this image. And uh, you will see that after I apply the Stony Hurst. But um, yeah, so the equator is not dead center there. It's a little higher. Uh, magnetogram, it's much more clear where I've drawn in my lines, marked the polarity inversion lines. Uh, let me just point out that's a much more difficult process at solar. Minimum when it's just all salted pepper. Um, that's a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, how exactly are you drawing these lines? How am I drawing them? Yeah. You, you familiar with Photoshop? I don't know, like, so what kind of like math or something that goes in there? Eyes, brain, okay. years of practice, <laughs> training from someone else who had 30 years prior to my experience. Right. Yeah, it's old fashioned. This was started in 1964. Okay. <laughs> We're trying to modernize it. This is part of the process, and we'll see what comes next. Okay. Um, elven magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, digital mapping and feature identification. Here we've overlaid a sun grid Stonyhurst disk. Um, which is utilized to adjust for B angle, add latitude and longitude lines, 
and determine the central meridian longitude. So in the original archive, um, transparencies were used and they were uh, at increments of zero, plus and minus one, plus and minus two, up to plus and minus seven. Not exactly precise. Uh, when I utilize the Sun Grid Stonyhurst, there is one for every day of the year. And so it is much greater fine tuning of, of getting that B angle adjusted correctly and moving the features. So um, once I've overlaid it for the correct day, I then trace over those black lines with red lines in Photoshop and pull that transparency away with the red lines on it and IDL. IDL code from Thomas Kuchar at Boston College uh, is utilized to convert the disk coordinates to a synoptic map format and place trace features at the appropriate central meridian. Uh, conveniently, Tom was able to utilize the identical uh, blank maps that I do for this process so you can see I haven't started at the beginning. Well, I'm not showing you at the beginning. This is of a map in process. So it places the features at the correct central meridian, the correct latitude and longitude. And then I can overlay them in Photoshop on my in process map. Um, so up at the top there, you see the output from IDL. And over here, you see I've laid the in-process map over that IDL output and made it transparent enough for me to be able to see both, uh, both sets of data. Then I adjust accordingly the data that was already on the map with the new information that I'm getting from the new image. So yeah, this was the AIA-193. Um, next, I would apply uh, filaments to the process we're not looking at the H alpha. However, here's the magnetogram. And just to kind of give you an idea how this works, you can see here that this was a positive polarity region where the neutral line turned around with the filament right there. However, my magnetogram suggested otherwise and that this stayed open. And I also got two filaments right there from the H alpha that also suggested it continued that way. Now you're probably noticing that those filaments are not lining up identically with that polarity inversion line. And that's, you know, if you think about when you're looking at an image of the sun, the closer to the center of the disk you're looking, the more straight up and down you're looking. The further towards the limbs in any direction, the more the curvature is going to influence what you're seeing. So I'm trying to pinpoint where the foot points of the filament are. And um, so it's much more accurate, closer to center disc. But what we do is we just adjust the position of our polarity inversion line to fit our filaments. We close that region down and everything is sort of a step-by-step -step evolutionary process. Um, real quick, I wanna point out that these maps Here's zero and here's 360. There is an extra 30 degrees from the previous and following rotations on each map. So that means when we quote finish a map, we get to the end here, we actually start the next map and move about two to three images over so that ever, any evolution that takes place that might affect what's in that overlap section is adjusted accordingly. Then, the digital mapping process is applied to the uh, complete black and white original map. Um, once all the data has been applied, it's processed in IDL and colorized resulting in a color GIF and FITS file, a searchable FITS file. Uh, in this case, we were able to utilize the identical programs that were created by Sarah Gibson um, to adjust the original maps rotation, make it the same size, um, put boundaries around the outside, uh, etc. And it's kind of like the process of colorizing it is a little like paint by numbers for big kids. Um, and the final result, basically, uh, you can search for, you can find all the sunspots, you can find the positions, all the filaments, if you want to study how the polarity inversion line moves. Um, polar crown filament moves over the solar cycle. You can see how the secondary polar crown filament becomes the primary polar crown filament from one solar cycle to the next. Anyway, 
while we are extending the, the original archive to include Solar Cycle 24, we are also creating a reproducible record of each step in the map making process. We are generating a machine learning ready digital atlas of labeled solar features for Solar Cycle 24 with the goal of making Solar Cycle 25 using machine learning only. So, the Macintosh archive, my conclusions and the future work. So gosh, we have come a long way. Um, that picture in the lower left there, that is Pat's basement. That's just one section of one room in Pat's basement. And any of you who are familiar with stat plots will notice above Bob's head in the middle there, that is a stat plot, handmade stat plot. He printed out maps, cut out latitude and longitude regions and stacked them together and paid them. It's a little fancier these days, what we do. Um, you can see a leg table in the back right corner there next to Pat's shoulders. That's a Pat on the right, Bob in the center, and me when I had a little bit on here. But yeah, it's it's really, it's come a long way from, from that basement. So great, Pat's life's work has been digitized. It wasn't lost. Um, it's not only been digitized and published, it's been used for research. So here's an example on the lower right corner of the kind of thing we can do for solar cycles 20 to 23. It's all sunspots, a nice pretty butterfly diagram. And we've also um, colored them according to polarity. So we get a real nice view of, of, of Hale's Law there where the dominant sunspot groups switch hemisphere time after time. Um, in a real kind of nice way. And we've done lots of other things. For example, we've done coronal hole studies. Um, how long do you guys think a coronal hole can last that's not a polar coronal hole? Almost three years. One lasted almost three years. So no one pays attention to that stuff. And that is the kind of thing that this archive can do. Called you anti coronal holes. There's <laughs> So, and you know, that was a very rare case. Most of them are gone in less than a rotation. Dimmings are gone in six hours, but it's not that simple. So that's the kind of power that a, that a database like this has when you can look at four solar cycles, five solar cycles. Uh, so the work continues. An additional solar cycle of maps is being produced currently with a slightly fancier method than the original. Um, Macintosh style maps have been made and used for solar minima in comparative studies. A couple of people, I think we've got uh, Shahida Sheikh is going to give a presentation in a little while. Um, she asked me to make a couple maps to study CMEs. We had a map before the CME blew off from the backside and a map after the CME blew off from the backside. And guess what? There were a bunch of filaments that were there on the first rotation in that area that were gone in the second one. So we couldn't exactly pinpoint it, but you know, we're, we're we're working on stuff like that. Um, someone else that I work with at Orion Space Solutions had the idea of going back and adding all known uh, CMEs and layers um, as a sort of potential overlay to the map where you could add that in, sort of a value added bonus you could get. Um, the machine learning work has begun and uh, we hope to have Solar Cycle 25 made by machine learning um, afterwards after I complete solar set cycle 24 and we figure out how to teach machines how to do this madness that we do. Um, and you know, this will allow us uh, with the additional solar cycles of maps to extend all the studies we've done so far. And keep in mind all those, those um, solar minimum maps you saw, those were the same coronal hole groups over and over again. That was like 19 rotations at solar minimum when magnetic fields are weak. So. There's something, something to figure out there. Anyway, um, we hope to extend the projects we've already done and find all kinds of new research that we can do with these maps. Uh, I really appreciate your time and let me know if we have any questions. Thank you very much. Well, I want to stay around for a minute afterward. I've got a quick preview of my Alaska slideshow. <laughs> which will come up in a little while, a couple of weeks. You gonna do that? Remotely, no. Yeah, I fly out tomorrow, first to Jersey. David Webb has raised his hand. Hi, Dave. 
<laughs> you have a question, Dave? Or uh, no, not really. Very nice talk, uh, Ian. Glad to hear about about all the details. But uh, good job. Talk to you later. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, with the CMEs, um, what uh, what what would be your source? The AIA or, or okay. So um, what we. I'm not as much the CME expert. That's sort of what uh, Robert Allen has also done stuff like that with me. Um, but what we kind of tried to do was look at the AIA data and see, because it's on the back side of the sun, see approximately where it came from and then compared it to what the features that we could see on the front side of the sun and their positions on the map. Um, and like I said, I made a map sort of before, i.e. it was on the back, and after it had blown off, the filaments were gone. And the filaments were gone. I've uh, personally, um, now I haven't looked at years and solar cycles of data, but um, uh, within a little, little amount of data I have looked at for CME specifically, 304 seems to be- Oh, is that right? It, I, yeah. It's kind of my personal favorite cool. when it comes to CME so far. But I haven't looked at as many cycles as you, so I was wondering. So you are looking at AIA, but with the CME itself, were you able to actually see it in 193 or? Well, that individual one that we were talking about, part of the reason I was brought in was because it was on the back side of the sun when it so you couldn't off. see it was at all in AIA at all? Oh, no, no. no. Well, you could see it, but oh, okay. if you looked at the limb, something like that, you know. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. So, but do you remember which filter was it? Uh, oh, we looked at we looked at a few different ones. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and also, she was the CME expert, and I certainly spent hours looking at it because I thought it was totally cool. Um, but she's giving a presentation here, Shahida. Um, I think it's a couple of weeks, and I'm not. I can't guarantee that's what this is what she's talking about, but she's the person to talk to about it as well. And Robert Allen, I can give you his. So I, I, I'm super interested. Um, I know that you were doing the comparison of uh, UV with the uh, to, to the for consistency, yeah. not necessarily yeah. accuracy. But I'd be really interested to see why there's a discrepancy. Um, I've only I've done work with today during the past, and usually that's a that's a reflection of the coronal um, radiation from above, and it's really a reflection of what's going on, right? Because the way that to make thirty is far. So one ninety three is more consistent. Why aren't the others? I mean, it, like identifying exactly where the yeah. holes are in AUV is dangerous because of projection of it. Yeah. So I always always like 10 30 is the way to go. Right. But if it's not showing up as their threshold of intensity from the corona hitting the corona star, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. something I'd like, I'd like. I totally understand that. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that has given me a lot of confidence in my conclusions. And that is that you saw corona hole only maps. But we generally make maps that also include filaments, polarity, inversion lines, and that sort of thing. And when I look at stuff like, I think it's 284, for example, and even sometimes 211 and 304 in particular, um, except for the poles. 304 rocks at the poles, but you get to mid latitudes, and all kinds of stuff looks like coronal holes. But what we found basically was that um, when you when you overlay the position of the coronal hole with the positions of the polarity inversion lines in the filaments, you see some fit inside and others look like they totally overlap. So that could be part of the projection effect where what's what's going on in the ground, there's a neutral line there. And so also filament channels appear as they look like they look so similar. Well, so, yeah. yeah. So it's it's kind of like it blends, yeah. you know. So that's one thing that we'll also do is if we do see that where it looks like we've got a guaranteed, you know, filament channel or even a filament sometimes, you know, they often come out more black. But anyway, we'll adjust the coronal hole boundary inward at that point to account for it. I was going to say that sounds like a great task for machine learning, like making 1030 like maps from your EUV images and training, training it on existing EUV contemporary and your CUV and 1030, and then trying to make those 1030 maps when you don't have them yeah. from the EUV images, and then doing your, you know, your tracing and yeah. having that consistency. Well, 
the amount of time that like Soho operated that overlaps with when it was consistent 10, 8, 30 is pretty long. So yeah. that's that's something totally realistic. Uh, you want to write a proposal? I'll do it. I don't know what you got to say. No, it's kind of smart. You want that. And you guys are building what you got to So yeah. it can be an asset. It's a great future <laughs> idea. Yeah. Actually, um, uh, postdoc here, uh, postdoc group, uh, Benoit Tremblay, oh, yeah. he actually um, is working on a, a machine learning to actually sort of derive the backside of the sun oh. as quickly as possible rather than waiting for 30 days, you know. So he's, he's using image and stereo as well. Yeah. Like earlier in the talk, he uses stereo and I forget all the other things he's using, all the other data sets he's using to train his uh, algorithm. I forget what his algorithm, I forget what the code is called, but. He's but, usually here. You guys yeah, 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 yeah. He usually couldn't move. Yeah. We should so, probably be calling it mono now. Yeah. Hey. Great talk. I hear a question about like normal whole boundaries. Yeah. So everybody, like, what's the technical reason they're so different? Like, what's the I mean, across all channels. The projection effects. Looking at different levels, different temperatures. That's what I was talking about. Like the actual boundary, um, I feel is better described at the at the lower boundary, like atmosphere or ten eight thirty or H alpha. Even it's really hard H alpha, but ten eight thirty kind of gives you more of a true boundary because the UV is more like to be very spread out mm -hmm. to get the actual. But it's been a, an issue for decades. Um, I actually held shine sessions and. I don't know how many times you know, on that very topic. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So, I guess my question, if you turn around the question, is what can we learn from that? That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because it's a magnetic problem, right? So, in the way, like, we're not measuring the magnetic field. So, it, 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 yeah, rate of chance, right? Say, yeah. yeah, because it's the, right, yeah, so. Also, the field of metrics, when you're seeing a lot of, a bunch of snap along your line of sight, you're not going to see what you want. <laughs> the ground truth. No, it's a great question. We should invest in it. Yeah. I mean, you can you can see right there that they're not showing identical things. <laughs> no, that's no, great. Sorry. Is it? Is this, I'm sorry. No, you. No, no, no. You, oh, no I'm just going to say it's a great answer. Well, it's identical things, but is it systematic? It's not systematically predicting effect either. Because if you're like whatever, whatever position oh, right. from the disk, right. it's not that the you always see that one yeah. channel is choose, but there's some in the right. Yeah. So I actually, um, and this is one of those things that I, I just think is going to be really hard to convince machine learning to understand. Um, I try and adjust the density of the coronal hole boundary, like what I call the boundary, based on what it looks like. And how it feels. Um, it's like for a polar coronal hole. I look at it and I go, oh, that's kind of near that active region. There's kind of stuff coming up. So I bet that's that. Is that in this. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I try and, and figure that out in my brain and adjust my coronal hole boundaries accordingly. But yeah, it's difficult. I missed yeah. I miss 30. Yeah, and Pat was really good. I mean, he would come, I don't know if it was weekly or monthly, he would bring his paper bounds, we would buy them, and I would use them for my actual research. Nice. So, yeah, that's how old I am. Sarah was going to say something. <laughs> well, I wanted to chime in on that last point, um, uh, Ian, and maybe with regards to the, the project you're doing, Project Orion, the project you're doing with Orion, uh, it, it, is the idea that you're going to be taking these new maps that you're doing and using them to actually train the machine learning. So some of the intuition that you've built up and learned from Pat over decades can be passed on to the machine learning um, in ways where they know what Ian recognizes as a coronal hole gets factored into the way the uh, machine learning develops the algorithm for identifying coronal holes. And yeah. Someone else here who knows more about machine learning might comment on that. Um, well, I. I mean, I spent hours with Ryan at Orion um, Monday and Tuesday, um, and I might try and convince you to join one of our meetings when we're talking about it with Michael Kirk and Ryan. But uh, the way we're talking about doing it is sort of a combination effect where they're a reward-based machine learning effect where, where they're both trying to get the machine learning to identify features 
and using reinforcement and rewards with seeing how close or off it comes to what I do. So it sounds like they're, they're looking at kind of a three-tiered approach to it. That definitely, I mean, that's the point. The point is that I was trained by someone that had X years of experience. Was, you know, that's, that's the point. So there, it's kind of a combination thing that is ultimately, I think, reward-based with how close it gets to what I do. And yeah, all the steps that I do. So when I draw on, a, on a, um, uh, an image in Photoshop, what I come up with on the Stonyhurst, what the, I, you know, the idea is, and, and I think in, in some way, the ways the most complex thing is adding the new data to what's existing. Because this is four days earlier than what you're putting on there. The positions of those neutral lines and filaments or coronal holes four days ago, they're absolutely going to be different. So it's the tying of the past to the present and then the next present, you know, over and over again. That's the really complicated part. But yeah, if I could get you to join one of those meetings, I'll, I'll talk to you about, I know your schedule, so <laughs> we'll talk.